Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church in our morning worship on October 11, 2020. I'm Pastor Bill DeHass. I serve as interim pastor of the congregation, uh, and I'm glad you're here today. We are holding in-person worship in the church on Sundays at 1030, but we realize there are many of you that cannot be present at that time, so we will continue to make these videos so that together we may all continue in the worship life of St. Paul's. So God bless you today as you participate in this worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm and another to his business. While well, the rest seized his slaves, mistreated, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace and peace be to you from our Lord Jesus. Amen. The first wedding I ever remember attending was less than memorable. I was about 10 or 11 at the time, and we were at the wedding of a daughter of family friends. I don't remember the wedding at all, but I do remember that the reception was awful. It was a hot summer day, and we were in the social room of an unair conditioned church. The refreshments were mints and nuts in a paper cup and overly sweet fruit punch, uh, and the wedding cake tasted like wallpaper paste. As a 10-year-old, I thought that wedding receptions must be God's punishment for getting married. Things have changed, though, haven't they? Many times now, receptions are big blowouts for which I wouldn't want to pay the bill. Uh, now, I do have to admit that I like a good wedding reception. I mean, there's something nice about relaxing, taking in good food and drink and uh, dancing, maybe even being a, a bit silly about catching up with extended family and friends that we don't see very often. Even in Jesus' day, wedding receptions were, were big events, and they weren't over in three or four hours. Sometimes they went into the next morning, the next day, or sometimes into the next week. We know that Jesus even attended a wedding reception and seemingly had a good time. It's no wonder that the final gathering of God's people is pictured often in the Bible as a great banquet. I mean, consider the very well-known Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup is running over. Our final encounter with God will be a feast, a banquet like none other, with no mints, nuts, or tasteless cake. Well, Jesus also used this imagery of a wedding banquet, although a little bit differently in this story from Matthew 22. Now, this is one of the harder stories of Jesus to hear, understand, and apply to our lives. 
Uh, sometimes it's only used to condemn people in the past as if it wouldn't speak to us today. All of Matthew 21 and 22 takes place in the temple in Jerusalem, just three or four days before Jesus is killed on the cross. And, and here Jesus is in conflict with his opponents. They were the ones who were in charge of the temple, who set all of the rules and, uh, and, and who had authority in Jerusalem. And here was Jesus, both very popular and also challenging their authority and their understanding. Now, I think a lot of the conflict is centered on Jesus uh, not buying into the idea that people could be divided into ins and outs, uh, those favored by God, those not favored by God, those who were clean and those who were unclean. I think Jesus basically said hogwash to all of that. Most of the stories here center on the fact that in God's realm, in God's way of doing things, human expectations are wrong. Now, as we listen to this parable today, and remember, uh, it's only a story uh, every detail isn't necessarily a, a reflection of real-life events. A king has a great wedding reception for his son. All the important people were invited to the reception, and when the servants of the king went out to tell them that the time had come, they refused to go. Not only that, they made excuses, made light of the invitation, and even mistreated and killed the servants who went to call the wedding guests. The king was enraged. He sent his troops and burned the cities of those who had refused, and he sent the servants back again to call all to the wedding banquet. And they came, both good and bad, as Jesus notes. Now, some people see this as an allegory in which every person or every detail in the story symbolizes something or someone else. And it's normally seen as uh, the history of the Old Testament and into Jesus' day as, uh, uh, as what's going on. And, and this is the most common understanding. Uh, you know, God's the king. Jesus is the son. People who refuse to come are the Jews. The ones who finally show up are the Gentiles. The wedding garments are the clothing that Christ gives people. And the guy thrown out is someone trying to get in on his own goodness and not through the merit of Jesus. More recently, though, there is a, a, a another interpretation of this, which I find a, a somewhat interesting, That uh, and it also has more of a political slant in which uh, Jesus is not saying the, the uh, kingdom of God can be compared exactly to this story, but kind of contrasted with this story, uh, in which the king is a representative of the, of the kingdoms and the powers of this world who subject people to their power and authority. And in this interpretation, the first people who refuse are like the upper crust of society, who shame the rulers of the world. And then the second wave are all the little people that are forced to comply with the king's demand that the wedding hall be filled. And in this interpretation, Jesus is the wedding guest without a garment. He's the one who refuses to comply with the ways of the world, with its lust for power and glory, and rather is the one who is cast into outer darkness through the crucifixion. Of course, in that understanding, the end of this story is not the end of our story, and that's probably a very good thing. Well, regardless of how you interpret this parable, I guess the big question is, what does it have to say to us today? Well, I do think that the parable is saying that God does intentionally invite us to his banquet. God invites all to a life of discipleship and to be part of the body of Christ, the church, in whatever expression that exists. It's not about being good enough to be invited or bad enough to be excluded. That's human thinking. It's about God's invitation, even to you and me. And of course, it doesn't end with us, even though it seems like Far too many Christians believe it's their job to lock the door behind them so the wrong people don't get in. Now, at the same time, will we always say the adage, God accepts us as we are, and that's true. God does not expect us to remain where we are. Our lives are always being called to change, to be conformed to the norms of the kingdom of God, which according to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, are wrapped up in mercy and truth and justice and holiness. 
And since a large portion of Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Matthew is about living out faith and not faking it, or not doing it just for rewards, uh, I think uh, maybe it's just a little bit of a warning for us. I think maybe the story of the guest without a wedding garment is about the fact that we do not earn God's love, and that our words and our deeds as Jesus followers are, are not about getting rewards or about faking it. It's a warning against being presumptuous about God and not living in his grace and not, being con not conforming our lives to Jesus' call. I have been invited, and you have been invited, to be part of the whole people of God. God says, come on in. It's a big party. We're not there because of who we are, what we've done, what we've left undone, but only because Jesus has died and was raised for us, and we are clothed in him, especially in our baptism. We are clothed in him so that we can conform our lives every day to his call for love of others, for peace in our lives and the world, and for God's justice to become a reality even here and now. Amen. Join together in confidence of God's grace. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We pray that even through global sorrows, the church can rejoice in your salvation, O God, that all church leaders be sustained for their ministries, and that all the baptized find ways in this difficult time to uphold what is honorable and just. That national conflicts be resolved without warfare and destruction. That leaders of the nations attend to the needs of the poor. That our country be preserved from discord, rancor, and violence. And that the election process will be just. We pray that the plague of the coronavirus will subside. That all who are sick from the virus, from rulers to refugees, be healed. That people living with fear be comforted that medical workers be supported and medical supplies be made everywhere available and that a vaccine be developed and fairly distributed. We pray that those who suffer from want be assisted, that those without work find jobs, that children be educated, that ministries of care be strengthened to feed those who are hungry and those without homes, that extremism be lessened, that a spirit of cooperation be nurtured. And for all the sick, we pray, especially those, these who names who we call out silently now from our hearts. And we also pray that in your mercy, you would welcome our personal petitions. Pray that you will receive our thanks for all who have died in the faith, that when facing our own death, you give us hope and that you grant us your peace throughout our days. Into your hands, merciful God, our Father, we offer ourselves and all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now hear us as we pray together as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each of you. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you.